It is great to see all of you this morning. Hope you've had an amazing week. While you're coming in, I'm going to kind of give you a little bit of a little, I guess you'd call a testimony rundown of, of my week this past week. Last Sunday night, I was talking to Hunter. Uh, he's out in Reno serving with uh, Living Hope. And as I was talking to him, Andy Gleiser, who is an, also an evangelist, he's part of the Living Hope uh, church planning team. Uh, his wife, Bryn, has been diagnosed with a terminal cancer. And so earlier in the summer, the, he, uh, he's been scheduled. Andy, as by vocational, part of that is part of his income comes from evangelism. And he has some support that helps him in the church planning endeavors. So he speaks at a lot of camps during the summer. And uh, I, when Bryn, it was announced that Bryn had her, her, her cancer had come back and it was terminal, uh, the director of the camp out in um, Arizona, Grandview Camp, had shot me a text and said, hey, if Andy for some reason is not able to come due to Bryn's help, health, would you be able to come out? And so I talked to Pastor Joe and, and he said, yeah, that's a great need. We'd be happy for you to go out. And then a couple days later, I heard that Andy was keeping his meeting. And I was like, man, praise the Lord. I'm so glad that Bryn's health is at the place where he feels like he can go. And Andy's a tremendous preacher of the word. I hate to say it, but like, like my boys are like, he's one of their favorite preachers, right? And so, which I mean, I love that he's one of their favorite preachers. It's just that I'm not at the top. You know what I mean? So, and so anyway, um, yeah, I know. I, shh. And so anyway, uh, he, uh, so Sunday night I was talking to my to Hunter and I said, hey, buddy, I said, how's, how's Miss Bryn? And he goes, oh, dad, he said, she, um, she's actually having to go to the ER today. I was like, oh, man. He said, yeah, he said, Pastor Andy just, just told me uh, just a few minutes ago that he's not going to be able to go out to Grandview this week, which start, started Monday. And I was like, oh, man. And I, I, get, I don't know, I don't want to be spooky, but I just felt prompted. So I texted Matt and said, hey, who's speaking for you this week? And he texted me back, well, um, Andy is. He said, I mean, he, he let me know yesterday it, it might not work for him to come, but as far as I know, he's planning on coming. And I said, um, just so you know, Hunter is talking to him at church today. He said he's not able to come. Well, Andy was not able to communicate because he was taking his wife to the ER. He had a lot of other things. During our text message, uh, he said, Andy just called me. He said, is there any way you can come? And so last Sunday night, as uh, around 5 o'clock or so, I was trying to book tickets, trying to get ready. And then so Monday morning early, got up in the morning, flew out to Arizona, and had an, preached an entire week uh, there at Grandview Camp in near Eager, Arizona. And God just gave a tremendous week. I mean, it was... Um, I kind of felt bad for everybody because have you ever have you ever like expected like it's I feel like it was somebody who booked first class you know for the and they were expecting Andy and then they and then they booked first class and they got coach <laughs> you know what I mean I kind of felt bad for those people like they're expecting Andy and they, what there's Savinsky what's he doing here and um, but what, one of the things that was really amazing is is um, how the Lord a Lord uses you gives you these opportunities and one of the things that was so encouraging which I didn't know I didn't have to hear. But that there were uh, there was a number of sponsors who were there, and one in particular had a, they had a, just about over half the campers. It was a pretty large church from Tucson, and they had a very unique group. And in it, three of their diff three different sponsors at different times came to me at different times and said, "You know, it is so obvious." He said, "We are so thankful that that you're here." He said, "Because God has used the messages, the specific text that we went through." And he said, and the way you communicate with our teens has really resonated with them. And God was doing real work in hearts. There were teens who received Christ, a lot of other tremendous um, decisions for Christ and spiritual conversations. And so it was not my plan, but it was God's plan. And I am thankful for community and the opportunity to have the flexibility to go help another sister ministry in gospel endeavors. And it was an exhausting, it's a three hour time difference, right? So it really feels like 630 in the morning to me right now, okay? So if I say anything heretical, just give me a little dispensation of grace, all right? Um, but I'm thankful for the week and looking forward to just jumping back in here at community and with both feet and trusting God to give us a great week here. We are in the book of Titus for our time this morning. I'll invite you to turn again to Titus chapter 1. Titus 1. We're going to pick up where we left off, but I want to say a couple things um, this morning before we get into it, not only as a bit of a reminder, but a way of clarification. So we began at the beginning seeing how Paul had, had left Titus and Crete to appoint pastoral leadership in the churches. And we're going to get into a section this morning that really deals with the pastoral qualifications, a really important part of the text. One of the things I want to clarify for you this morning or help you with is this. 
um, is I want to encourage, I, I, do not, I did not intend, and I hope it didn't come across that way, for you to think that if a church got a pastor from another place that it's a bad thing or sin or wrong, because it's not. And that I, what I was, my, my emphasis was this, is that churches need to really be, the idea is, the ideal is we ought to be seeking pastoral leadership out of our own congregations. That doesn't happen all the time. And there are actually multitudes of reasons why that may take place that are good reasons. And so it's not wrong for a church to find a pastor. For example, there may, be, there may not be a man who meets the biblical qualifications in the church. There may be somebody in the church who is not quite prepared. They're not ordained. They've not been vetted. And so there may be somebody in the church who could be a pastor, but they're not ready. There may be, there may be a need in the church for a pastor, and there may be somebody who's qualified to be a pastor, but his gifting is not according to the specific need that the church has. And then, of course, we need to always remember the sovereignty of God. There are times where God will move people in different places by his choosing to allow them to serve in different capacities. And that is all good. My goal, my heart last week was this, was just for us to understand the importance of that we need, to be, we need to be intentional and purposeful as we can in our body to help develop pastoral leadership, not only for the future of community, but potentially for the future of other gospel endeavors across the world in missions. And perhaps even the Lord may raise somebody out of this church to pastor in a another church somewhere. I'm just going to use a case in point. Uh, you know, my son Hunter, born here, grown up here. He's preparing for ministry. Uh, his goal, Hunter's, like one of his dreams is he wants to be ordained out of this church. But he will probably not be, like for his life, be a pastor here. He will probably be going to Ireland. That's his long-term dream, to be a bivocational pastor serving in the country of Ireland. And that is amazing. My point is, God can use this church to help raise up godly men to serve in gospel pastoral endeavors, whether it's here and other places. Some churches, by the nature of their size, they don't, they don't have much. And by their location, lots of challenges. And so let's pray for God and let's be intentional. And I believe that's one of the, that is one of the things I really love about our, our pastoral team here is that there is a passion for this. And that we have a desire to be a part of God's process of, of helping prepare and train the next generation of pastoral leadership for a community and beyond. Okay? So Titus chapter 1, we're going to be looking this morning. Um, we're going to pick up where our text left off last week. And we're going to see, I want you to look with me please at verse number 5. And just a kind of a reminder, he says, This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. One more clarification point. He didn't just walk into a church and say, Who looks good here? The idea is, is that he came, he went into the church. He found men that met these biblical qualifications. By the way, this is very important because it really, it really flows into what, how we do it today. They found somebody who met these qualifications that was recognized by the congregation. Recognized by the congregation that these men meet these biblical qualifications and then they were put into pastoral leadership, willing and able, and they were put in pastoral leadership and these men were then became the pastors, bishops, elders of the church serving in pastoral capacity. All right, and so he says here, uh, in every town as I directed you, he begins to give some of these qualifications and we're gonna try to get through all of them this morning. Number one, he says, if anyone is above reproach. That's the word that uh, many, the King James translates, blameless. It's, it's someone whose personal life is beyond legitimate accusation of public or personal scandal, okay? So it's not, some people have taken this and they've really misinterpreted it and they say if you're blameless, it basically almost means you're sinless. That's not, that's not what it means. We're, we're not sinless men. We sin, we make mistakes. But the idea here is, is that it's a person whose life is above reproach. They're, they're, not that they never do something wrong, but that they have men of godly character and testimony that are, that are not involved in, in such sin that a, a, an accusation could be made against them that would stick, that would mar the testimony of Christ, and that would be scandalous in the public, bringing shame and reproach on the name of Christ would be detrimental to the gospel. 
And I, he goes on to say this. Look with me, please, at the next part of the verse. He says he needs to be above reproach. He says the husband of one wife. Literally, it means a one-woman man. I want to make one other clarification here. In the, in the moral purity of, a, of pastoral leadership, this is really important, that's really what, the, what he's zeroing in on. Some people have taken this, unfortunately, to say, you have to be married in order to be a pastor. That's, that's not true. Generally speaking, God's plan for most people is marriage, but it's not God's plan for everyone. And so the idea is, is generally speaking, in that society, most men were married, but the idea is moral purity. So if a man is single, that doesn't mean he can't be a pastor. And one of the reasons we know that is because we know that the Apostle Paul was not married. And he was definitely an elder and pastor. Now, one thing that's really important for us to really hold our pastors, our, we want in our pastoral accountability, is that we have men of moral purity, men who are blameless, they're above reproach in their family, in their familiar relationships, and that they are a one woman man. They are a man who is faithful in loving his wife. Then he goes on to say this. He says, well, if you look back at our text, he says, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Now, it does not mean that a, a guy has to have children in order to be a pastor either. Who gives children? God does. That's his plan. But generally speaking, most, the majority of married couples have children, but it doesn't mean that all married couples have children. Again, that's in the sovereignty of God. So this is general. If they have children, this is to characterize their life. And he makes it pretty plain here. He says that they're not, they're, they're not accused of debauchery or insubordination. They, that means they, they, they know Christ. That's that they're believers. They believe in Jesus Christ. And they are not, they're not unruly. They're not accused of ungodly wicked that's the idea of the debauchery is engaging in these we call them the dirty sins of our culture and so it's really important in our pastoral in our pastoral qualifications that the children that are being raised are children who come to know Christ as their savior and that we want them to be they need to be children who are not living in this kind of wickedness and sin. Most Bible commentators, now obviously, you've got for example, even in our, our own pastor's family, mo all except for the Tracys, all of the kids are under teens. Oh, except for wait, no, um Karis is a teenager. So we not yet. Slow down. Slow down. She's close. She's really close. So we've got so we have so we basically we have um Caden and Noah, and that, those are the only pastoral kids who are teenagers that I'm aware of. Okay, okay. almost cares. All right, but I'll slow down. The idea here is this, is that it's not that the children, again, are the, all children struggle with disobedience and misbehavior and those kind of things. That's not what he's talking about. He is talking about a child living at home under the parent's roof, who is who knows the truth, but they live in active and open rebellion against the gospel, and they do that by intentionally being rebellious to the faith. They're rebellious to their parents. They are, and they do it by living in open, unrepentant sin. And they do it in a in a public eye. That's really what he's getting after. And so he's really kind of laying out the importance. Hey, listen, we need to, we need, these are the, the beginning steps of these qualifications. Listen, he needs to be a, a one-woman man. He needs to be a, a, a pastor who uh, has children of the faith. That's he's leading and shepherding his children in the faith. This is, praise the Lord, this is not as much anymore. But I want to make a comment historically in historical fundamental Baptist churches. There was a, a time in culture, specifically when my dad, uh, many of you know my dad, Jerry Savinsky, my dad's generation and the generation after, they lived in a culture, and this may surprise some of you, but it was very common for pastors, specifically and evangelists, and many missionaries in that culture who had this philosophy. You take care of the ministry, and God takes care of your family. And the, the most important thing to them was, their, was the ministry. And so they would neglect their wives and they would neglect their children in order 
to serve the church. And my dad was one of the first, of it, first guys in his generation that I knew of who openly stood and fought vehemently against this. I mean, he said, this is unscriptural, it's unbiblical. My dad says, here's kind of his little phrase he likes to use. He says, if I lose my family, I've lost my ministry. He knew that he had the priority of his wife and his children. And I can tell you, I can tell you today the names of other brother evangel men who are in evangelism in my dad's era, some a little older, some a little younger, whose children fit this description and were a detriment to their testimony in the gospel of Christ and even pastors and churches. I personally met as I traveled men who probably should have stepped down from pastoral ministry because of the wicked and godly lives of their children. And the reason, one of the reasons their children were living in that way is they neglected their family for ministry. That's not God's plan. So that's a really important thing. And we want to make sure that our pastors, our pastors here, need to know that their wives and their, and their family relationships are of utmost importance. And you need to understand as church people that there may be times our pastors make tremendous sacrifices for our church, and they will. That's the nature of ministry. But there, our pastors need the time and they need the opportunities to take the time to parent their children and to love their wives and their families. And that is a priority for this church. And that's a priority for our pastors in this ministry. Really important. Look with me, please, as our text continues, he says this. He says, for an overseer, and that's where the word, that's, uh, where the word bishop is used. If you might have a different translation, the word bishop or an overseer. He says, for an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. As the steward of God, the word here that's translated steward here is the idea of the commitment of a task and its responsibility to someone. So... God has given a specific task and responsibility to pastors and leadership. And he says that this, the, the one who is in this, they are required to, to be above reproach. They are accountable to God for how they oversee the church. That's something I think that until you, I mean, you, you may know about it, but to actually understand this, when you are in pastoral ministry, it is really hard to describe the weight of accountability that is upon the soul of a pastor. And the fact that we, as pastors, are going to give an account to God for how we stewarded the churches that he placed us in to be pastors and overseers and elders. And he just lays that responsibility out. Now he's going to lay out a few more things, some, some, some character qualities and qualifications of pastoral leadership. Look with me, please, as our text continues. He says, he must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain. Here's this big list here. So he says he's not to be arrogant. The word arrogant means self-willed. Or to be obstinate, to refuse to listen to others, to stubbornly hold to his opinions and pushes his rights and agendas on others. He wants, he wants his own way. That is not to be the character of a, of a man of God, of a pastor of a church. A godly pastor, a godly overseer is not to be someone who is arrogant and stubborn, who pushes his way upon people, and who is um, not teachable and, will, and refuses to listen. That doesn't mean that he's not a man of conviction, that he stands on truth. That's, this is not at all what he's referring to. But he's saying there needs to be a humility instead of arrogance in the life of pastoral leadership. Look at our text again. He says not only arrogant, he says quick-tempered. The idea literally means not a habit of quickly becoming angry or quick-tempered. You're not to be someone who is controlled by your temper, but one who has temperance, who is controlled by the Spirit and is gentle. It is, it's very interesting. Again, if you've not been in pastoral leadership, it's very interesting how, how people can provoke you. <laughs> and you would be surprised. I, I think some of you, if you ever were able to experience what it was like to be in pastoral leadership, and you were to see how, how the way different people seem to poke and provoke and to stir and to irritate, that you would see why this is put in Scripture. 
But he says you're not to be quick-tempered. They're not to be soon angry. There's not to be a habit of quickly becoming an angry person. Matter of fact, it says not only is not to be quick-tempered, he says they're not to be a, a drunkard, someone who is an alcoholic, someone who is given over to alcohol. Why? Because a person is not to be controlled of wine, but they are to be controlled by the Spirit of God. He says they're not to be violent. The word violent here is the idea of actual, like, physical violence. And sometimes you need to go back into this culture a little bit and realize that back when this was written, violence was actually pretty common in their culture. Now, it's not the way you and I always think of violence. Like, we think of violence a lot of times. We just think of a knockdown, drag out, draw, you know, throw, throwing your suit coat on the ground and getting your shirt open and two guys getting their fists out and just kind of duking it out. Violence many times in that culture, in that Middle Eastern culture, <laughs> this is kind of funny, but it's like the, the tugging of the beard, like grabbing somebody's beard, it's an insult, and grabbing their beard and, and pulling on their beard, the slapping of the face, the grabbing of the hair, the pulling of the hair. Sometimes it was a two-sided grab. Sometimes it was a chin grab. But there were different ways. And it could sometimes then degenerate into actual fist fights, wrestling matches, those kind of things. That's not to be the way pastors handle problems. That's not the way we're to shepherd people. This is, I'm, I will not give the name of the church. Do not ask me. When I, I, I hadn't been youth pastor here, I hadn't even been here a year. And I, I learned of a church in our area where the pastor of the church would settle his... This was well known. I heard this from more than one person. That the way the pastor would settle his disagreements with the deacons was fistfights in the church parking lot. And that wasn't 40 years... Well, it was a long time ago, but that was 25 years ago. But that was still going on when I was youth pastor here. And could you believe it? They were losing people. Can you believe that? That's not how we're supposed to handle problems, is by resorting to physical violence, by fighting to get our way to beat people down or to intimidate people to bully to get our own way. Another one, another requirement here, he says, is not greedy for gain. This refers to an overwhelming desire, covetousness for money, for things, to where he is serving for the intent of getting wealthy. He's not to be greedy for gain. A pastor's motivation for serving in a church ought not to be to, for, in order for him to make himself wealthy. Some guys, they want a pastor, for not only, not only do they get a salary uh, and benefits from the church, but then they try to leverage the relationships in the church to, get to, uh, for investments and this and this and this in order to try to make themselves wealthy. And so then they make relationships with wealthy people and they try to use their influence and power to gain wealth for themselves. This was, this was something that Paul was trying to strive against. They're not to be greedy for gain. But I want to stop here for a second and I want to make a comment that, and, and Pastor didn't know I was saying this, so that's not why he left. I just want you to know that. This is, this is, I have no idea why he left, but this is not the reason, okay? He has no idea what I'm about to say. I want to say this, because this is really important. One of the things that churches across the country have gotten wrong is the biblical care of pastors. I'm going to ask you a question, and I want it answered only scripturally. Not experientially, not from the past. I want it answered scripturally only. What is, according to the New Testament, what is the church's number one fiscal, and we understand what the word fiscal means, right? Financial responsibility. What is the church's number one financial responsibility? What is it? If you're bold enough to answer, I, I'm, I'm, I know you know this. I'm not trying to scare you. What is it? What's the church's number one fiscal responsibility? Yes. Nope. But it's a good guess. It's important, though. It is important, but that's not the number one. God has ordained that they that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. The church's number one fiscal responsibility is to financially take care of their pastors so that they can give of themselves to the work of the ministry. That's the number one fiscal responsibility of the church. It's not a building. It's not even missions. 
Matter of fact, Scripture makes it very clear, not only are they worthy of double honor, the scriptural principle that's stated in the Old Testament and in the New is this, you do not muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. You provide for the one doing the labor. And the church's number one financial responsibility is to take care of the pastor. Not that he is to be greedy for gain or the goal is to make him a multimillionaire. How he stewards and manages finances is between him and the Lord. But we as a church have an obligation to take care of the needs of our pastors. And a church financially should really take care of no one better than the pastors of their church. Now that's very hard for pastors to say. Because it seems very, oh, it's, so, it's, it's, so, it's like so self-serving and it benefits them. Can I tell you something? Whenever you are obedient to scripture, the people that are the most blessed are the obedient ones. It's not self-serving for a pastor to stand up in front of you and tell you that you ought to be faithfully giving and that the church's first responsibility is to financially take care of their pastors. It's not self-serving because it's biblical. If God commanded it, it's not self-serving. It's that basic. And yet we have men all across the country who are not being taken. I see this continually, unfortunately, of churches that almost look for reasons not to take care of their pastors. And they have this mentality that pastors are supposed to be poor and they're not supposed to have anything and they can't have anything nice. And if they look nice or have a nice vehicle or they go on a nice vacation, we should be suspicious about something because they're pastors. You know, it's okay for us to have all that, but not them. I had a guy one time walk up to me. It was so funny. He walked up to me in evangelism. He comes up to me and says, he was really kind of a snarky dude. He walked up to me and goes, oh, man, it must be nice. And I, had a, I did have a truck, had a trailer. It must be nice having a big rig driving around. You must be raking it in, man. I looked at him straight in the face. I said, I'll tell you what. I will, let's get a lawyer, and I'll get a contract. I want to switch, I'll switch salaries with you. He goes, yeah, right. I said, let's do it. I said, I am dead serious. I will trade salary right now. If you will find a lawyer, I will make a contract, and I will, we will trade salaries. I'll live on what you live on for a year, and you live what I live on for a year. His smile kind of faded a little bit. He goes, you don't know what I make. I said, nope, and you don't know what I make either, and I guarantee you that I'm going to come out ahead on this one. You know what happened to his smile? Went completely away. And all of a sudden, the guy who was assuming that I was raking it in didn't have enough faith to live on what a preacher lived on. You expect preachers to live by faith? Would you like to live by the same faith you expect your pastors to live on, folks? Hmm? Oh, all of a sudden it gets down to the nitty-gritty, doesn't it? A little uncomfortable. They're not to be greedy of gain. But churches, we ought to be taking care of our pastors. And we ought to do it biblically, and we do, ought to do it out of love. And we shouldn't just provide for their needs. We need to take care of them. We need to love on them. We need to go above and beyond just the basic requirements. We need to show them and express love in tangible ways to our pastors, encouraging them as they labor for Christ. None of our guys are getting rich here. That's okay. But let's provide for their needs, and let's encourage them and let's not make, let's help them. But sometimes when you don't have stuff, sometimes it gets harder to start, start wanting a little bit more. Our pastors are responsible before God not to be greedy of gain. And we as a church are responsible to take care of our pastors. Let's continue. Look at this next. These, now he gets into some real encouraging things here. So he's just, listen, he's not supposed to be violent, not supposed to be greedy, not to be an alcoholic, not to be um, prideful. But in contrast to all those things, Here's some, here are some other things he's supposed to be that kind of are on the good side, the, con the contrasting side. Number one, he says he's supposed to be um, hospitable. Literally means a lover of hospitality. Someone who loves strangers, who loves to care for others. Someone who um, is devoted to what is good and, and right. You know what? I, I wanna, I, I, I've been here for 25 years. And I want to say this is, I am so thankful. I, I have... In my tenure at community, Pastor Joe and Becky have been an exemplary model of hospitality. And I can say that for, some, for other pastors as well. But I'm going to tell you, of all the pastors that have been here, the most hospitable ones that have modeled this. And I'm not saying the other one. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not poo-pooing on other people, okay? I'm just saying they've been exceptional at this. 
they model this. They love people. They love others. They, en they engage personally in the lives of people. They have people to their home continually. They are engaging. They love others. They love strangers. They're not just loving church people. They're having people in their, in their neighborhood and, and other people. They're having other people in their homes sharing Christ, sharing the gospel, pouring out their lives. That's hospitality. And we need, there was, a, again, a, a mentality back, even when I was youth pastor, when I began youth, being a youth pastor, and it was this. Pastors should not be close to their people. I actually had, my, in my first youth pastor at my first church, I had a pastor tell me that I needed to stop spending time with people in the church because you don't want to get close to people. You shouldn't get close to people. Now, he had zero scriptural back, backing for that. Matter of fact, that's anti-scripture, according to this text. But there was a mentality of, you are not to spend time with people. They would never have people in their homes. They would very, if ever, rarely, they would not go into people's homes. They would only go in like a church function setting or go out to eat with a group. That is not what this is talking about. We need pastors who love people, who will engage personally in the, in the lives of their congregation. They love hospitality, who care intentionally for others. They're also to not only be hospitable, but they're to be a lover of good. They are to love what is, what is good. They're to, it can actually be, it's a little bit of a different kind of way to translate it, but, but devoted to what is best is a lover of good. They're devoted completely to what is right, to what is good, to what is best. They love good things. They love, good, they love doing what is good and best for other people. They're devoted to themselves to doing what is good and best to others. Not only are they lovers of good, they're self-controlled, which is the idea of being sensible, that they have right priorities, they're thinking right, they, are, they, can, they have the ability to, can, to, have, to exhibit self-control, temperance in their lives, and it comes out in their, in their families, in their finances, in their attitudes, in their desires, but it's, it's a desire of a personal discipline, self-control, that they think right, they have, they're able to put their priorities, they're able to think rightly about life and things, and they're able to manage all of that in the context of the local church. Not only are they to be self-controlled, but they are to be upright, which another word of that is just. So they, are, they love truth, and they want to be obedient to Scripture. And so what, in other words, instead of being a respecter of persons that says, okay, you know what, I like this person better than this person, and so I'm going to treat them differently because of how I like them, Instead of doing that, they're going to do what's just and what is right by treating both according to Scripture. Does that make sense? So, so say, just say, for example, the guy, there's a, somebody in the church that just naturally gets along with the pastor pretty well, and maybe they've developed a good friendship, and they're involved in sin. And then there's another man in the church that the pastor has, that just because of just kind of personalities and different things, there's been a little bit more conflict and they don't, and there's, there's not that same close relationship and that man's involved in the same sin. The pastor is going to deal with both men the same way biblically because he is just, because he chooses truth. He wants to do what is right. He's doing what pleases God and what is just according to scripture. He's allowing scripture to dictate how he pastors rather than his feelings. Now, then he goes on to say this. Not only is he um, a person who is um, just, but then they're, they're holy. They're devout. They're righteous. Um, sometimes when people look at that, they're a holy man. Have you ever? It's really funny how a guy who has a collar on looks holy. Holy, right? This is not about an appearance. Does that make, are you with me? It's not about an appearance that he's trying to give. It refers to a character and manner of life. It does not mean that he never sins or that he's perfect. The idea of the word holy is that it is a person who is devoted to righteousness and they're opposed to unrighteousness and the pollution of sin. That's what they oppose. And so even in their own life when they sin, they're, they're consistently confessing and forsaking it, and they're seeking to become more like Jesus Christ, allowing him to change them through his word. And as, his, as God's word reproves and rebukes them of sin, they have a, a character of desiring and seeking to be more like Christ and living a life that is against sin. 
not only are they to be holy, they're to be um, disciplined. The word temperate, to have control over yourself, to mastery, to be self-disciplined. Um, we kind of, we've already talked about it just a little bit, but the soberness, the idea, that's kind of more in the thinking part of a person. Um, but it's the here, the temperance is kind of really in the actions. They're able to control it. They're in every area of life. Sometimes it's their temper, sometimes it's their finances. It, whatever it may be, they're exercising discipline and self-control as they're surrendered to the spirit. They're obeying the word of God and they're not, they are a, a person who is committed to obedience even when that means restraining either A, selfish, or B, sinful desires, or even the comfortable thing. They're going to do what is right. They're going to do what is difficult and, do what, and fulfill their obligations to Scripture, even when it may not be easy, when it may be difficult, when they don't feel like it, because they are a disciplined person, a person of self-control, who doesn't live by their feelings, but they're walking by faith in obedience to Scripture. Look at me, please, back at our text. He says this, he must, and this is really an important part of the text, he must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught. He must hold firm. It is a, it's a command, it's a requirement. This person, a pastor is to, it's a strong commitment. The idea of holding fast is like the death grip, right? Right? Death grip on truth. Death grip on truth. Holding with all of their might. Not ever letting go. But what is he holding fast to? To the trustworthy word. Or it could be translated the faithful word. That's the word of God. By the way, God's word is faithful because it came from a faithful God. And it is this, in the, the word of God that came from a faithful God is the faith to which we cling to. What we believe to be true about God and his word, the gospel, that's what we cling to. And I want to say this. We need pastors who cling firmly to the truth rather than tradition. We need pa- that's, that's what we cling to. We cling to it. A man who is, has a bulldog vice grip on truth, who has committed to holding fast to it. And it says, as he has been taught, if you look back at the, at, the, at the text, as he has been taught, in other words, according to the sound teaching that he had received. So he's holding fast to the, to the truth of God's word that he had been taught. He's clinging to it. But what he's clinging to most, and the wording is intentional, he's holding fast to the faithful word. He's holding fast to the word of God. And we need in our church, and we need to pray for our pastors to be men who have a bulldog grip on the truth. Then he says this, look with me please as our text continues, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine. This is one of the themes of Titus is sound, or the word sound can be translated healthy doctrine. We need, he needs to be able to, he may be able to give instruction in sound or healthy teaching, teaching of the scripture, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. So by healthy teaching, by solid, biblical, truthful teaching, that they can rebuke and those who contradict it. So those who fight against the truth, they are able to stand for the truth against wrong teaching. That is actually a very difficult job for a pastor many times. Now, sometimes it's pretty easy. Like when somebody, if somebody were to come into church and say, Jesus isn't God. That's pretty easy to hold fast to that, right? And Jesus wasn't a man. He was, he was like a man, but he wasn't a man. That's, that's, that's something pretty easy to just grab a hold of and fight against. But sometimes what happens in a church, sometimes a pastor, by being loyal to the word and seeking to rightly divide the word of truth, sometimes people come in with because of their background or what they were taught or different things, and they either have some conclusions or they have some preferences and some different things that are not necessarily out of scripture. Or sometimes, and this is kind of one of the hard ones, is when a person has a, like a personal belief or standard or something that has been informed by scripture out of context that's really hard because now they think they think it's biblical but it's actually not and then when a pastor says but this is what the word of god says i'm seeking to be obedient to the truth of god's word and this is what it says they get mad at him 
And I want you to understand, I believe, I can, I, I believe I'm speaking well for our pastors, is that it is our desire to hold fast to the faithful word so that we can, be, we can teach healthy doctrine. We're teaching the word of God. And then we are able, with that truth, to be able to rebuke false doctrine, false teaching in the church, whatever that, whatever that looks like. Whether it's something that is really obviously blatant against the truth or whether it just seems to be kind of close to the truth. But we have an obligation to hold fast to the faithful word. And I had a, I've had men, people in churches, but specifically in my first church in Indianapolis, where it, I, I'm going to go into all the details of the circumstances, but it was the chairman of our deacons. And he looked at me. I said, it was the way something was being handled. And I said, brother, I said, God's word says this. This is what we need to do. And he looked at me in the face and he said, Pastor Brent, I know that's what the Bible says, but. I know that's what the Bible says, but. Can I tell you something? That's when you have to stand firm on faith. That's when you contend for the faith. That's when you stand on the word of God. That's when you hold on to it. But that's also where I, I realized that there was a man in our church who was in a spiritual position who did not hold fast to the faithful word. He wasn't a pastor. He was a deacon. But what he was more concerned about was pleasing the people that he felt like he was representing rather than being faithful to the word and honoring his Lord. We have a, a, a group of pastors here who want to hold fast the faithful word, who want to be led by it, guided by it, directed by it, reproved by it, corrected by it. We need God's word to change us to be like Christ. And it is our responsibility to hold fast to that faithful word, to lovingly from this pulpit, to proclaim it and preach it and teach it, and in our lives to seek to live and model it, and in our interaction of shepherding and overseeing the flock of God is, that is here in this assembly, to not only model it, but in our interaction with you to be as faithful as we can to the word of God, and to hopefully be used of God to help you in your Christian life, to help you to be instructed by sound and healthy teaching that he might even use in your own life per, at times to maybe reveal that what you're holding to isn't the faithful word and maybe even might even be re rebuking some wrong thinking or wrong teaching that you've received at some point. But it has to be a, a bulldog commitment to the truth. This is what God requires of men who are pastoral leadership. So in the text... Here, what, what we find is this, and I know that was a little bit longer than I was in, hoping for, but that's a lot of stuff to get through. But what we find in this text, this is when Titus went into the churches. These were the men, the kind, this is what the men had to, they had to match up with Scripture. These are the character qualities of men who were to be elders, pastors, overseers, bishops in the church. Can I encourage you as we, as we kind of wrap up our time together this morning... I want to encourage us as a, as a church family to keep these in mind for future pastors that may come out of this church as we are looking at men that may be, uh, become a pastor in this church, even young men like my son Hunter or others who may become a, um, a pastor here or someone who maybe comes from outside our ministry to come in to shepherd in some capacity. We need to pray about that. But I want to challenge us most of all to pray for our pastors. Matter of fact, we're going to do that this morning. We're going to take just about, about a minute. And I want to encourage you to kind of, if you want to keep that text open, and would you pray and just ask God to help our pastors to live out these scriptural qualifications so that they might be blessed and used of God at Community Baptist Church. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Let's take about a minute, and let's ask God to help our pastors to live according to his word. And then I'll close in prayer.
Father, this morning, I ask that you would help the pastors of Community Baptist to be men above reproach, faithful to their wives, to raise their children to know Christ and to walk with him. That they'd be above reproach, not, not self-willed or arrogant, not soon angry, not given to alcohol or violent, not to be greedy for gain, but Lord, to be hospitable, to love others and to invest in people, to love what's good, to exercise self-control in their lives, to be upright, holy, to be disciplined. And help us, Lord, help the pastors to hold fast, to hold firm to the faithful word. And that we'd be able to give sound, healthy instruction from the word here. And then also, not only to give sound instruction, but if necessary, to be able to use the truth, to rebuke those who contradict it, and to be able to give understanding of the truth to bring greater obedience to it in our church. We pray for your blessing upon our ministry. Bless our time this morning. May your word give understanding and may it uh, change our thinking and how we look at pastors and how we pray for them. I pray that you bless our morning service to come and I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are dismissed.